The Linux Action Show is created by Jupiter Broadcasting. It's sponsored by Ting. Go to last.ting.com to save off your first device or plan and DigitalOcean. Go over to digitalocean.com and use our promo code LASTDIGITAL and then you can spin up your own Linux rig for free. Welcome to Linux Action Show, episode 364. My name is Chris. My name is Noah. Hey there, Noah. Good morning to you. Good morning, Chris. Noah, here's the big show. Brace yourself. Here it comes. Today, we're going to talk with the lead found with the lead developer and founder of the Carita Project. Now, are you familiar with Carita? I was like sort of familiar loosely with it, but after talking with our guests, I realized this is one of the most amazing and impressive open source designing applications out there, and it's really about to get. A lot better. They just launched a Kickstarter. We're going to see what is the goal with that Kickstarter. Where is the project going? And how the heck are they going to actually make it faster and better than Photoshop? We cover all of that ground and a lot more in today's episode. Plus, in the news segment, a ton of Ubuntu stuff is breaking. CryEngine gets support for Linux. The chip computer looks amazing. And we've got a great feedback segment. But Noah, before all of that, before all of that. The picks. It's the picks. And uh, I love this one you found. I don't know if this got sent in or if you just came across this, but this is the world's first Ubuntu-powered drone. That's right. This drone runs Linux. Now, I, it looks yeah, it like a Lego like, device a little bit. <laughs> it was actually sent in. I, I, unfortunately, in my, in my haste, I didn't grab the, uh, the, the name of the gentleman oh, okay. who sent it in. We'll try and get that in the show notes before yeah. it gets sent out. But we have covered a couple different drones mm -hmm. on the Linux Action Show. And of course, all of them are powered by Linux. And really, when you see those robotic things, almost naturally, everyone kind of gravitates towards Linux. But this I thought was particularly cool because it's actually Ubuntu that is running on on this drone. Yeah, and it's is it actually in that computer on the drone itself? So it's not just I the believe control so. computer? Oh, that's that was, cool. That was my understanding. Now, there's a video down there, there I think. You ready for this? Mm -hmm. All right, I'll go mm -hmm. play this. Uh, so this, they, I, I love it. I love it. And they say this is the first flight with snappy Ubuntu core powering. It's running, so this is like the latest stuff, man. Snappy Ubuntu powering this drone. Here we go. Let's take a look. <clears throat> From Ellie or Airy Copter Robotics, it looks like. Yeah, or, uh, yeah, early robotics. Oh, look at this. So it's in the snow, uh, and there they go. It's taking off for flight. It looks pretty good, Noah. Huh. And uh, I wonder, I guess if you're going to have a drone, having a transactionally updated base operating system is probably a good idea. That's probably a safe bet. I tell you what, if I bought this thing, the first thing I would do is mount a camera on it, and I would take it to all the Linux Fest. Yes, 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 absolutely. That's what I'd be doing. Yeah. Because the, the camera shots you could get from, and you know, I remember I remember a, a while ago, a couple years ago, I had said, I was like, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to yeah. mount a camera on a drone and fly it around. And, and a bunch of people made fun of me and said, oh, that's so stupid, that'll never work, blah, blah, blah. And no, now it's man. like a thing. There are people that not only do it, they're very, very good at it. They can fly, they can fly these things around like no tomorrow, and then they'll catch it out of the air and, so, and go do it. Again. It looks like to me, Noah, it looks like to me he's controlling it with his phone. And so mm -hmm. those of you that are watching the audio version, uh, it took off, and now they're bringing it right back to where they took off from. And it looks like, it doesn't look like a traditional like stick controller, it looks like a phone. See that? That is really neat. Yeah, that's, that, I think that's pretty popular nowadays for the... Um for the uh, for the uh, controls, Build it yourself, mainly because I think everyone has a smart yeah well yeah. everyone has a smartphone yeah and then it's just something that you always have with you That's and true. additionally you have a number of different radio options you can do Wi-Fi if you're in range of like mm -hmm. one network mm -hmm. uh, or you can do Bluetooth for direct <laughs> communication I've even seen a couple of them that have like a like a little uh, thing that plugs into the headphone jack and then it has a little like 2.4 gigahertz really? transmitter really yeah it's RF it's like an old it goes, like its yeah. own RF system well that's that mm -hmm. would I would almost yeah. trust that more than anything else. Uh, You're right, and I think that's the way that, if I'm not mistaken, and I, I could be wrong on this, I'm pretty sure the DJI Phantom has its own uh, so separate RF thing that you can control. Noah with. and I both want to, like he was just implying, we both want to pick up a drone for our Linux Fest coverage so we can do like crane-like type shots of the fest, mm -hmm. of the crowd mm -hmm. outside and all that kind of stuff. It'd be really cool. Hey, one more badly. thing before we jump off this one. Uh, according to the folks they were chatting with uh, that were building this, they're going to take advantage of the Ubuntu Snappy Go packages for drones and robots, and they're going to actually make packages you could deploy on your own drone using Snappy packages. And, and we're going to talk a lot more about Ubuntu Snappy and what the hell Snappy packages are. I know, you're thinking click packages, right? Oh, well, wait, Debs, clicks... Snappy packages, snaps, what it, what, we're going to talk all about that stuff in the news in a little bit. But just keep in mind, as we get to that segment in the news today, uh, this is an example of something that would be a snappy package that you could sell, uh, potentially. Uh, that's just crazy to me. It has automatic launching. Um, uh, it has bri it'll bridges over Wi-Fi. It'll telemetry. It can also do USB for uh, debugging. And all of that will be included in that snappy packages that uh, 
That's pretty neat. Yeah, so this one, it says no, they're controlling with uh, Wi-Fi. They can do 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. Mm-hmm. And they, yeah, that's, that's slick. Yeah. Uh, it has a flux, fi- uh, flight time of approximately 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that'd, that'd be plenty of time to get the camera shots we need, wouldn't it? <laughs> the nice the nice thing is, too, is I was just doing a little bit of research. Apparently, the way that a lot of those drones work is if they do lose connectivity, Wi-Fi, or Bluetooth, they have a return-to-home function. And so they, it, it's not like they fall out of the area. Right, need, if right, it loses yeah. connectivity, it'll try to connect for a little bit. If it can't, it'll turn around and come back and land to a pre, uh, predefined spot. Yeah. That's not so bad. Because the last time I played with RF, uh, uh, the last time I played with a remote control plane, uh, if, it, for, if the battery died in the remote, the plane would just go... That so was, that was uh, in your plane. this uh, this copter here, this uh, like uh, uh, this four wing copter, it, it's uh, three ninety nine, mm-hmm. um, uh, but not in U S dollars. So I don't know what the conversion would be. Um, and is uh, it pounds? Yeah, or uh, okay, so it's euros. About, so 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 about eight hundred dollars. A little under that. Yeah. What? Oh. Really? Isn't that right. It's a little over twice, right? Jeez, I don't think so, but I don't know. But okay. either way, like compared to the drone you and I were looking at, which is a thousand dollars, this is still cheaper. Right. Yeah. That's what. That's kind of yeah. what I was getting yeah. at there. Yep. Um, and so we'll have a link in the show notes if you want to get an Ubuntu-powered uh, drone. That'd be pretty cool. And they have a whole bunch online. So around, f- right, so some people in chat room says 450. Some people in chat room say 616. <laughs> I don't know. But either way, it's cheaper than the one you and I were looking at before, and that one didn't run Ubuntu. Yes. It's in uh, – Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's in funny money regardless, but it's cheaper than what we were going to pay. I'll tell you that. And you know how we're going to afford that drone? Because we're going to save a whole bunch of money thanks to our first sponsor because they have an incredible value, and that's DigitalOcean. Head over to DigitalOcean right now for your own Linux-powered cloud machine. You need to play around with Docker and containers. You need to deploy a web server. You want your own own cloud instance. Maybe you want to put up a GitLab deployment. DigitalOcean.com. Simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up your own cloud server. It's all based on Linux. They're using KVM for the virtualization. Now, let me tell you more about this, though, because this is a truly amazing package. They started with these core, true, fundamental technologies that everyone in the audience can, can, can totally vouch for. We, we depend on these kind of things uh, throughout the infrastructure of the Internet. KVM is industrial grade, and it's the virtualizer we use here at JB, too. And so I was, if I'm going to pick a VPS service, it's got to have some, t- it's got to have the core technology that I can trust, and that is where DigitalOcean comes in. So they're basing it all on tier one bandwidth and hardware. They they have the best data connections in their data centers in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. Really great stuff, all running Linux. And here's the best part, though, is it seems like when you go in on an infrastructure like this, it's going to be extremely expensive. But you can get started in less than 55 seconds. So it's not going to cost you a lot of your time. And the pricing plans are only $5 a month. For $5 a month, you can get 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. But if you use our promo code LAS Digital, L-A-S Digital, you'll get a $10 credit, and you can try out that $5 rig two months for free. And I think that's a really cool opportunity because I'd like to invite you to go play with things like CoreOS, go play with, the, with, a, with some of these deployments up in the cloud where they truly perform at another level. And you get to use their cool management tools that DigitalOcean has, like their awesome dashboard. It's very intuitive to use, and you can replicate its functionality with their straightforward API. And from within here, you can create your droplets, destroy your droplets too, obviously clone them, back them up, take snapshots. You can do full DNS management which is really great once you get going. You want to put a nice domain name on there. One-click installations will save you a ton of time. Ruby on Rails, Docker, GitLab, Ghost, WordPress, all the great stuff is just one-click installation away. And they will deploy a full Linux stack for you, up-to-date, ready to go. They really grok the latest Linux technology, so they're constantly rolling with it. When they decided to work with the CoreOS team, they worked directly with the upstream project. They, get, they have an update channel directly with that project. When they decided to roll out FreeBSD support, they worked directly with the FreeBSD project to make it awesome. And then, and then they released tons of documentation. Because after all of this, you get the $10 promo code and use the promo code LASTDIGITAL. You get to go try out any of these rigs, the pricing structure, Super straightforward, pl- tons of OSs to choose from, lots of one click applications, and great tutorials. In fact, go over to DigitalOcean right now and just check out their community section. You might find there's resources in here that are helpful to you even if you're not a DigitalOcean customer, uh, like the System D Essentials that they just put up. This isn't going to be specific to DigitalOcean. Yes, if there is a tie in that makes it work with DigitalOcean very well then, of course, they're going, to tie, they're going to tell you that. But here, they're just giving you uh, instructions on like managing system services using systemd, or enabling system services, reloading system services without having to fully restart them. All of this, getting overviews of your systems, managing basic log information uni- using journal CTL, this is all available on DigitalOcean. And DigitalOcean has paid for this content. And they have hired full-time editors to curate this content. 
And they do this because they know that having documentation like this is going to make DigitalOcean even better for you. So go use that promo code LASTDIGITAL. Try out DigitalOcean two months for free. Check out their community section and read through their tutorials. This is one of many good tutorials they have. Many, many good tutorials. Here's another one. How to install Puppet to manage your server infrastructure. How to deploy Rails apps with Unicorn and Nginx on Ubuntu 14.04. Automatic deployment of scalable WordPress sites. There's another guide. How to set up multiple WordPress sites on a single Ubuntu VPS. How to manually initiate a droplet upgrade to the latest DigitalOcean cloud. All this stuff. Tutorials that are available to just make your experience even better. And they have so many more. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code LASTDIGITAL, $10 credit, and that supports the Linux Action Show and keeps us going. DigitalOcean.com. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Okay, Noah, we have a desktop app pick, don't we? Mm -hmm. What is it? We do. So this is Fort, and it is a uh, GNU <coughs> uh, Linux-based password manager. Now, I know that uh, you use uh, an alternative product, and, and I actually, for the most part, I have too. However, I'm seriously considering switching to this, mainly because it's, it's local, so nothing is happening in the cloudosphere. And I really like that. I yeah. really like things that, yeah. that aren't necessarily stored on the cloud. Now, there are some disadvantages to that, right? Because if you use a lot of different machines, and I know you are bouncing around from <laughs> one machine to another, this is going to be a little difficult. Because best I can tell, <clears throat> the only way to get your passwords to sync across different devices is to back them up and move them. Yeah. Um, um, and that's going to be a real pain. There's probably like some back-end magic you could do, like syncing or Git or yeah. something like that. But uh, hold right, on. but then you're going to store them in some sort of central place. I got something mm -hmm. for you. Hold that thought. But uh, so okay. let's go back to this. I want. I got. I grabbed a few screenshots of Fort. It's kind of hard. They don't make binaries of it directly available from their website. So you basically have to find right. a package it up for your distro. Uh, and like you're mm -hmm. familiar with KeePass X and, uh, and uh, things like that. And KeePass is yes. great. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, Fort is a Qt-based uh, password manager, which is kind of neat because, uh, you know, sometimes the Qt desktop folks get left out. And it seems to replicate all of the basic functionality of uh, LastPass, you know, with a master password that gets you into the vault. Mm -hmm. uh, so Fort looks pretty good. It's F-O-R-T, Fort Password Manager. Noah, mm -hmm. I wanted to also mention to you, because this kind of solves the other problem, but it's, it stays in the Qt realm, Qt Pass. Qt Pass is a multi-platform GUI for password management. Uh, for and it uses the back end on the on the back end is using pass which is the standard unix password manager so it's a front end to a standard unix tool so there's a command line component to this and this is the qt mm -hmm. front end to it and one of the things that's kind of neat about this guy is you can do a, f a per folder user selection for multi recipient encryption so you can share certain folders of your password uh, database mm -hmm. with certain people but not all of them uh, it has experimental web dev support for syncing between machines and i have never used this but supposedly experimental support for integrating with Git to also sync between your machines using Git. Don't know how, you, how that works. And then I guess also they sure. have smart card uh, support in the works as well. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, so Fort smart and QT Pass, great. both two really great uh, QT programs. Yeah, you're right. Do you use smart cards at your work? Or I, well, I do. I use the YubiKey, which is, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it is, yeah, I mean, they, they, you know, they, they, they brand everything. But the reality is inside of it, that's what it is. It's a smart card. And so you use things like OpenSC, OpenSC being a, a smart card daemon for Linux. Um, and that's how I do that, uh, that SSH thing where I can, mm. if my YubiKey is plugged in, I can SSH into a server. If it's not plugged in, I can't. It just, it kicks me back out. Um, those things are possible because of the smart card support in Linux. Yeah. So if these password managers would do the same thing, that is super, super compelling. I love the idea of this ATM card-like uh, security, something I have and something I know, my ATM card and my PIN, or in this case, my smart card and my PIN. And if I can get those security features implemented to protect all of my passwords on the Internet, I feel like I'm that much ahead of the game. It's going to be pretty difficult if I'm generating a, a 30 or 35 character password, uh, capital letters, <laughs> lowercase letters, numbers, all that stuff. And all I have to remember is my four-digit PIN and my smart card. But for you to guess my four-digit PIN and to obtain my smart card at the yeah. same time is going to be relatively difficult. Now, uh, Noah, uh, I, it looks like uh, Saucy Fox in the chat room uses the Git integration quite a bit. It says it, it's no problem at all. Mm -hmm. It just works off the file system, and it should be fine. Now, they on here are listing some of this as experimental, but I would agree. If it's just working on the file system, it should be fine. Yeah. So uh, QT right. Pass or Fort, they both look really great. Fort looks a little more user-friendly, uh, mm -hmm. and QT Pass looks a little more feature-rich. So it kind of mm -hmm. depends on which one you need. 
Uh, we'll try we'll, both. Yeah, we have them linked in the show notes. Hey, you had kind of a fun uh, de- uh, weekly spotlight this week, something that I thought would be impossible. Can't be yes. done, Noah. This can never be yeah, done. What I've tried. It? I tried. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, yeah this, is, this is a little bit embarrassing, but I'm going to eat crow. So uh, uh, a, a while back, I was reloading my laptop, and I was having a little bit of uh, trouble with it, and I thought, well, maybe it's the operating system. You know what I should do? I, I, I like the LTS of Ubuntu, but I also like the... I also really kind of like my sure, RPM-based sure. distros, and I like the Red Hat company. So I thought, I know, I'll put CentOS and use it as my desktop, or I'll use Red Hat 7 as my desktop. Well, I went to do that, and it was a nightmare. I mean, it was horrible. I couldn't even get GNOME 3 to work properly. It just kept going into fallback mode, and I kept reading tutorials on how to change it back, and I wasn't able to to get it to actually work. Well, sent into the sent into the program yeah. was uh, a gentleman that is doing exactly this. Yeah. He is using CentOS 7 as his desktop what? distro, and not only is he doing that, he's blogging about it, Chris. <laughs> so you can read, we have it linked in the show notes, and you can go over to his blog, and he is doing day by day how he is tackling his day by day day by day things and right off the bat I knew a couple things that I didn't get to work and it wasn't for lack of trying I spent a couple hours on it and I said all right can you watch DVDs in VLC could you get those you know that lib CSS all that stuff and he, yeah this is how I did it I said and you got VLC and stuff yeah this is how I did it well how about gnome 3 yeah Love this is it. how I did it and I'm like wow that's awesome so uh, full disclaimer CentOS 7 Red Hat 7, not a desktop distro. Not what they designed it for. You right. are very much fighting against the hill. You're fighting against the grain. And if you go into a form and tell them that you're using a distro that is primarily meant to in, be, be run as a headless server, and you're telling them that you're trying to run a full-fledged desktop on it for home use, uh, most people are going to say you're using the wrong tool for the wrong job. And I agree implicitly. That said, this is by far one of the coolest spotlights, I think, that I've seen since I've been on the program because yeah. the guy is successful. He's yeah. making this work. And if he can do this, I might follow his footsteps because I, the idea of installing a five-year installation that I'm going to have support for five years as long as I can get all of my stuff done. And there are little things like I don't know how you're going to get Telegram installed on CentOS or Red Hat. I just don't see how that's going to happen. But if he can do that, if he can make that happen somehow – and he can tell me how to do it, I would consider following in his footsteps. I think that's an dude, awesome idea. Dude, I'll tell you how you do it. You run everything in a VM or a Docker container, and you just use CentOS to get that's the desktop cheating. up and running. No, that's cheating. That's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a more complicated uh, URL because it's on github.io, but we will link to it in the show notes. Uh, so uh, he's been blogging uh, for a while now. I, I think this is actually pretty neat. He should keep yeah. it up. Yeah, it's a super, it's a super neat spotlight. It's a super neat project, and kudos to the guy for I forget his name off the top. Uh, Cabby uh, is is the one that's doing it, right? Oh, cool. Um, and so and so, kudos to him for actually uh, for actually doing this. It, it that is a that is a true vote of confidence. The Linux probably even a little bit more than I have to, to oh, go for a, a server West distro like that. Is is a great o- distro. Uh, it is on for the servers. desktop though. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a little rough. Yeah. It's a little rough. All right, Noah. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, I wanted to mention something. Uh, one more thing before we get out of the uh, the pick segment is um, coming up in uh, in just a couple of days uh, on next Monday. I think the 18th of May. Yeah, it is the next uh, Monday. Uh, the 18th, uh, MS Build is happening in New York. Uh, yes, I know it's a Microsoft meetup, but we're going to have uh, M- Michael Dominic from Coda Radio there. Kind of, you know, Microsoft's been making a lot of noise these days around Linux, so he's going to go in there and get the scoop from the from the scene. He's going boots on the ground kind of guy. And if you want to join him, uh, if you're going to be in the New York area. You can sign up for the meetup. Go to meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting and hang out with some JB crew members and Mr. Dominic and discuss the happenings. I think that could be a lot of fun. So uh, meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. You can also sign up for the meetup page just for future events. This one's in New York. We'll have uh, another one in the uh, Seattle area soon. And one day, maybe Noah will have a meetup at the lake. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, this, cool. th- this, is a, this is a happening thing. Here's the thing. I have a feeling... I know of one other person that listens in the chat room that's from this area, and I did run into a, a student at, at the university that listens to the that listens to the program, but I have a feeling I am very much outside the realm of most of our listeners. Yeah. That said, yeah. I will buy the food and the, uh, I'll buy the uh, the refreshments, if you will, uh, and bring them out to the lake and give free rides on a boat and tubing and water skiing and whatever to anyone that wants to come, and we'll totally do a meetup in Grand Forks. That'd I don't be know sweet. Come, you know what? I, know what? I, I, I've been joking about going out there during the summer. I should actually do it mm-hmm. and then yeah, we could have should. a meetup when we do it that'd be really cool we could make it happen dude it could be yeah, like yeah. just the most chill geeky meetup ever like a bunch of geeks out in the lake be pretty great yep. all right Noah. Yep. well uh so 
without internet. <laughs> One more plug is meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. Go there. We're going to do other meetups as well. We're just getting things started, so you can get in there at the ground floor right now. Uh, but, you know, that's up to you. Maybe you don't want to barbecue. Maybe there's something wrong with you. I don't know. Noah, let's do the news. <laughs> Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by... Ting.com. Noah Ting is mobile that makes sense. Ting is my mobile service provider, Noah's mobile service provider, and really the, no, the mobile service provider of the whole JB crew. Go over to Lin, uh, sorry, last.ting.com. Hold on, there we go. Click it. Last.ting.com. You see that? That's a good-looking site. Now you're going, Chris, bro. Why am I going to last.ting.com? I don't know what Ting is. Why would I want to go there? Well, first of all, you love the show. Right, chat room, go there right now, last.ting.com. You go check that out, and I'll tell you, you're going to, right off the top, you're going to save $25 off some Ting service, or if you uh, want to grab a brand new device, you're going to get $25 off that device. Now, I know your head's spinning. Chris, this is a lot of stuff. Come in. Let me tell you a little bit. Come in. Come here. Let me tell you about Ting. Ting, it's mobile that makes sense. Take, like, everything you know about the mobile industry, what's been beaten into you. You've been, you've grown up in an industry that oppresses you, son, and I'm not, I'm not even kidding. There, there is a duopoly out there in the wireless industry here in the U.S. Now, the situation might be different outside the U.S. In fact, sometimes I get comments from folks outside the U.S. and they go, I never knew how bad you had it in the U.S. No, you've probably heard this. I never knew how bad you guys heard it, had it in the U.S. until I heard your Ting ads. Like, people outside the U.S., it's not quite as busted for them, but here in the U.S., right. it's terrible bad. The situation's real bad. Um, let's start with the fact that mobile is one of the most important expanding markets in technology uh, in the last five years, right? Easily seven, eight years now. It's just critically important, uh, and especially as our wired connections get more and more gummed up, uh, as competition uh, evaporates there, more and more onus goes over to the wireless. And that is a little scary when it's controlled by two companies that have no customer interest at all. Two companies that just truly want to milk it for everything they can. And that's why I switched mm -hmm. to Ting. I switched to Ting before they were an advertiser because this is the platform that I believe in. It's mobile that makes sense. You pay for your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. There's no contract, no early termination fee. You just pay for what you use. It's a flat $6 for your line and then your usage on top of that. And on top of all of that stuff, they have no hold customer service. You can call them at one 855 Ting FTW, so that's obvious. It's really, that's great. Nobody else does that. They have an excellent, excellent dashboard to manage your account. You can transfer disabled devices too. Turn them off if you don't need them for a little while and save additional money. This is great for like hotspots. This is super sweet too because for me, uh, at times I just need data. And like my ISP, I have Comcast here at the studio. Sometimes it goes out. I like that I don't have to worry that like, I'm scamming the system or I have to go get some sort of special data package. I just check yeah. the box, and I just have mm -hmm. tethering now. It's, it's just built into the Ting package. Everything else is as right. well. And we don't think about the fact that we are, in, we are essentially indebted to a lot of those companies. And we, mm -hmm. in the U.S., we have just learned to kind of look past it. But the reality is when you go to one of the big box providers and you buy a phone, you don't own that phone. You think you own the phone, but you don't because you're paying for it over the next two years. And people say, well, I get my phone cheaper. I'm getting my phone for $199. No, you're not. <laughs> no. You're paying eight or $900 yeah. for that phone. You're just paying it over the course of two years. And you owe that company that contract. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You have an agreement with that company <laughs> for X amount of money or X amount of years to, to pay off yeah. that phone. And, and so, so really, you don't own the phone. You're, 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 you are in debt to that company. And with Ting, when I buy a new phone, I upgrade on my terms. If when I want a new phone, I'll go to, la to last.ting.com and I'll yeah, buy myself a exactly. new phone and now I have a new phone. And yeah. if I want a new phone every two months, I can do that. And you know what? We don't talk about this very often, but Ting has partnered with Glide. Glide is kind of like eBay for mobile electronics. Yes. And what they'll do, yeah. I take, have you ever used it? It's yep. slick as snot. Yeah, it they really mail is. you. You you tell them I have an S3. I, I got rid of my S3. I said I have an S3. Glide sent me a box. Came to my doorstep. I set my phone in. I put a sticker on it. I closed it back up. I put it back in the mailbox. Uh, they deposited the money. They sell it for me on their website, mm -hmm. and then they just give me the money. And then I used it to go then buy another phone on Glide, which they found for me from somebody else. Packaged it up. Sent it to me. I opened it up. I ended up having a problem with it. Put it back in the box. They sent it back and sent me another one. Replace. Everything was all taken care of. Yeah. Um, and what other phone provider is going to do that? Where can I go? I can't go into any of those other stores and say, listen, I want a phone, but I can't afford three or four hundred dollars or five or seven or eight or nine hundred dollars for a phone. So I want to spend a hundred bucks and this is the phone I'm looking for. Tell me when you find it and then go ahead and ship that to me. I Let noticed me know too, that the chat just called out. They added the uh, Galaxy Tab S. You can get the 10.5 inch tablet, make phone calls, no contract. You own it outright. Ting has a $76 off uh, special right now. Go to last.ting.com to get our $25 discount. Last 
Glass.ting.com. If you have a if you have a GSM compatible device or CDMA compatible device that works on the Ting networks, uh, then you get a twenty five dollar credit. Now before we run. Uh, I, I do like to do the app picks. We used to do these here on the show, and Kyra has taken them over and uh, helps get a little more out of your mobile device since we just got done talking about it. So uh, we'll wrap up with this. Kyra's here with our app pick of the week. Kyra, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Kyra's wearing sunglasses, Noah. Kyra's wearing sunglasses. All right, I don't know what this is about. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Okay, all right. I just That, that sort of threw me off when I saw that. Kyra, take it away with the app pick of the week. Can you take your selfies to the next dimension? Yes. I'm Kyra, and this is the Ting App of the Week. <laughs> That's <a 3D. laughs> that was great. Let's face it, photography would be a lot better if we could manipulate it at our whip. That's precisely the idea behind Fuse, a new app that allows you to take pictures that are interactive. The end result is pretty cool. You can take a virtual tour around any object. Wow. Or look around a beautiful landscape. Oh my god. All at your own pace. It's like Functionally, VR. Fuse is very similar to Instagram or Vine. The real difference is how you take the pictures you share with the Fuse network. Rather than just taking a still photo, the app presents you with four directions of possible movement. It's up to you to figure out how you want to take that picture. You can capture something that's tall by tilting your camera up. Neat. Or you can pan left or right to capture a landscape. Look at her go! Conversely, you can move around an object. There's plenty of possibilities, and we recommend checking out what others have done to get future ideas. Once you record your movement, Fuse stabilizes the video and converts it into their format. Oh my god. Add filters to the image, tag it, and leave a comment. You can That's even share awesome. to Facebook, Twitter, or Tumblr. Once posted, others can experience your Fuse by tilting their phones. Oh pretty my cool, gosh. Huh? Fuse is currently in beta. Have have However, from our testing, it works pretty well. We've started a Ting Fuse that you can follow, which gives you a new perspective on our upcoming devices and office shenanigans. What? Fuse is free for Android and iOS. Get it today and let us know what you think. Also, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and tune in next week. Until then, see you in the third dimension. F Y U S E. I, I wonder if you have. Do you have to have the Fuse app to view the pictures? Yeah, and post them it's on like Facebook? Instagram. Yeah, okay. it's like Instagram. Uh, but uh, okay. that's pretty neat. Uh, that's like holographic Instagram. Uh, Last.ting.com yeah. to get your discount. Go start saving right now. I've saved over two thousand dollars in the last two years. You can see how much you'd save too. They have a savings calculator. Last.ting.com. Big thanks to Ting for sponsoring. Links action show. All right, no. Let's talk about Ubuntu's massive change uh, that I totally called. I just, I, I was, I wasn't even going to say this, but come on. I so called this in Linux Unplugged. Uh, Ubuntu is talking about something called Ubuntu Next, or let's let's try to keep it all straight here because there's a lot that's actually happening. But uh, there's going to be a new variant of Ubuntu <clears throat> called Snappy Personal. And Snappy Personal will be based on Ubuntu Snappy Core. Now, uh, uh, Snappy Core itself is designed for servers. It's a transactional-based Ubuntu OS where the core file system, the root file system, is read-only. And then when you apply updates, it's essentially like decompressing an image, extracting that to its new file system, and then you boot into that. If it works great, you use it. If it doesn't work, you just switch back to the old file system. It's sort of like a way to guarantee updates don't break anything because you have two different sets. Uh, so I, I thought, geez, wouldn't this be amazing on the desktop? You take the desktop, you make you make that read-only, like the core OS is read-only. You bring in applications inside containers. Well, it kind of sounds like we might have something sort of like this. Snappy Personal is thought to take the place of Desktop Next, which was going to bring in Unity 8 and Convergence. If you're following Ubuntu, you know that Next is the iteration of Ubuntu. It will feature Unity 8 and Mir. Uh, the idea is that this would be the version that powers desktop phones and tablets for the full convergence experience. Snappy Personal will be the desktop image that will install Ubuntu 1510 uh, that's built with Unity 8 and Mir. The difference between this upcoming release and previous releases is that the image will be built uh, with Debian files and then packaged in such a way to isolate snappy packages from others. Canonical is considering a sort of sandboxed approach to the platform such as applications that are installed after the operating system will be separate from applications that make Snappy Personal make up Snappy Personal. So like, lib they, like applications would bring their own libraries, they'd be self-contained applications. They say this would eliminate the need for PPAs. I'm not exactly clear on how, but I'll get to that in a minute. OS upgrades would be what they say is quote-unquote guaranteed. This also increases the security of the platform. That could be debatable if you have multiple copies of libraries, but we can work that out. Uh, and uh, Snappy packages can be rolled back. Snaps will be universal for, bo for both desktops and phones. So, Noah, any initial thoughts when you hear about maybe switching from installing uh, applications? So say you wanted to get something like um, Firefox installed on Ubuntu, and you didn't mm -hmm. have it installed already for some reason. You would maybe mm -hmm. instead of getting a dev file for it now or, or something like that, you would go get a snap package for it. And that would maybe include mm -hmm. all of Firefox's dependencies. Maybe you could even have a version that includes Flash with it. 
Uh, but it's a huge change. It means all developers are mm -hmm. going to have to repackage for Ubuntu into this kind of snap format. It could have a big impact on certain derivatives. No question about that. And of course, they all can go from yeah. upstream. But what do you think, Noah? So, uh, if it was a if it was a global thing, if it was a if it was a community thing that everyone was going to jump in on, I would think it would be awesome because one of the things that I have always missed in Linux was I've always wished that we had a universal installer, and I know that that is a that is a hot button issue, and that there the are people that say, well, we compromise freedom by doing it and yada yada but the reality is it's a very 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 difficult obstacle to overcome for windows and mac users mm. to come to a platform that and even though you there's the argument about each distro is is really its own operating system whatever the, if it was if it was spread across uh, all linux i would be more in favor of it to me this seems like one more step where canonical is just getting that much further away from what everyone else is doing and that'll be great if you're an ubuntu developer and you're using ubuntu on on your computer and you have Ubuntu customers only, then I guess this is a this is a really great step forward. And so, being that Ubuntu is the biggest distribution, then or at least the most popular distribution uh, for for most people switching, then I guess that's a really good thing, and yeah. we should be thankful for it. But I have a hard time really getting too excited about it because it's. Oh, it sounds like it's only really going to apply to Ubuntu, and I'm sure their answer to that would be, well, other people could implement this if they wanted to. But yeah. So uh, I guess my my reaction to it is uh, I actually think this is a pretty smart move because I mean I was kind of advocating mm -hmm. for it I guess to begin with but uh, I, I reason why I think it's kind of a smart move is it really could provide a way to give a bulletproof core OS aha uh, but um, still make all of the applications current on the desktop keep everything current right. no longer having to wait until um, Ubuntu 15.10 to get GNOME 3.16. Like that, those kinds mm -hmm. of things would be really, those are the kinds of changes that if Ubuntu could make those kinds of changes, I could start to use it again as, as my primary desktop. Yeah. Uh, I want to because back up a little bit. basically they're moving to... Oh, go ahead. They're moving towards... Be, well, be, you're saying that because basically they're moving towards that rolling, uh, yeah. that rolling idea that you yeah. like. Yeah, and isolating the core OS from the applications, just like FreeBSD does, just like can be achieved on CoreOS itself. But uh, what I wanted to back up and talk about for a second was, um, I don't think it's going to be that big of a change, really, for end users. Um, so the, you're going to get these applications, you're going to discover these applications through the new software center. We've discussed in Linux Unplugged last week that essentially I think the current plan, things are subject to change, the current plan is the Ubuntu software center is going to be phased away. It's going to be end of life when, when we go to the next version of the Ubuntu desktop. We're going to take what's available on the phone today, expand that to make that available for the desktop. That'll be how you get these snap packages is through this. Now here's the component I'm not very clear on, and I would really like it if anybody in the chat room could clear this up for me, or if we have anybody from Canonical in the chat room today. From what I have read, it appears to me that the back end of this new Snaps packaging system is proprietary and locked off to Canonical. That anybody can implement a front-end Snap installer or client to access that back end, like their own store or their own command line utilities. But I, I, I do not know if it is the case that anybody can implement their own snap package backend. I think only Canonical could do that. And I could see that after we've seen the controversies and concerns around projects like Mint using their repos and using their packages. I could see them going in a direction that makes it sort of almost impossible to do that. And see, these snaps provide the Ubuntu ecosystem. They, they, it's, it's, it's something like we talked about that drone. These mm -hmm. snaps, you can install software from anything from a frickin' drone and phone all the way up to a desktop. And in order to be able to say that's actually something you can accomplish and you're going to be able to do that on X time scale, the only way they can deliver that as a company is if they control that technology. Right. And that's the position right. they're in. Now, I don't think that necessarily means they have to control the back-end storage, though. And I don't know if I'm right about that. I'll continue to try to read up on that. But that's what I've read as of this weekend so far. This is all really new. So that yeah. has me concerned. Yeah, I, I mean, there, you know, and, and I, you make a good point, right, is the, this idea that the... <clears throat> the biggest problem I have with Ubuntu going to a true rolling release or things that even kind of imitate the rolling releases, <clears throat> rolling works really great if you're using all GNU software, all uh, software that is, that's open source or has a lot of contributors to it. The problem becomes when you have companies like IBM that release a piece of software for Linux and they go, oh, well, Linux really isn't a priority to us, but, you know, this 1004 LTS thing came out, sure, we'll, 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 it works now. And then it works, and then, but then for a while we live in this grace period Yes, where this right. application works on Linux, but then right. if it changes too much or those yeah. libraries get swapped, and it doesn't seem to take very much have, before that application just doesn't work. And then and those I large companies, this. you're hosed. We've yeah, seen this in production. First hand, I've seen it. Yep. Yeah. 
Uh, like uh, so we had a we had a capture card nervous. that uh, only worked on Ubuntu. So Noah specifically mm-hmm. mentioned Ubuntu 10.04 because there's a capture card that we have that the last time the vendor revved the driver, the last time the vendor changed anything was for Ubuntu 10.04. Well, guess how well that works in Ubuntu mm-hmm. 14.04? It doesn't. So this is right. an area where this could be, I don't know about drivers because kernel's kernel, but uh, this is an area that could be solved by this because you could mm-hmm. install that application as a snap for 10.04 and the rest of that operating system, the rest of that world on that server can continue to move with the rest of the industry, but that that's that See, isolated that application like. can stay in, in its 10.04 hell for the rest of its life. Now, I don't know how secure so, that application is, but in, in terms of technically feasible, it is it uh, is possible. Right, and that's that sounds great. My question then becomes, so how is that different than Docker, and why are we... Doing uh, taking all these resources to to this entirely separate project when that sounds exactly like what Docker set out to accomplish. Mm-hmm. Well, so this is but this is also a package manager and a store repo <clears throat> and you know like it's like it's a wider it's 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 yeah it is an interesting uh, thing that we're gonna have to keep watching because I feel like I have a little bit of whiplash because I was just starting to wrap my head around click packages and I thought we were moving yeah. to click packages and now we have snaps <clears throat> and I think snaps are the 2.0 version of click packages so click isn't really going away as it's just sort of changing into mm-hmm. snaps I think it's so kind of wouldn't that mean they're going away I guess yes but then I'm, I don't know. Replaced. I, so it's a story that we'll continue to follow, and uh, maybe we can get some clarification from our friends at Canonical. Maybe Popey will join us on Linux Unplugged yep. on Tuesday and set us straight. I bet he has the inside scoop. He could probably tell us. Uh, all right, so uh, we'll have more links in the show notes if you guys want to read about that. One more Ubuntu story. Uh, Noah grabbed this one. Ubuntu plans for Python 3 by default in Ubuntu 16.04. Do you think this could uh, affect you at all, Noah? So I, uh, I am traditionally I am not a developer and I uh, I don't do a lot of developing. However, I got a little bit of a bug uh, to to kind of get into programming and and Rakai did his best to convince me to uh, to jump into the the, the Ruby world. Um, but I actually found a, a real <laughs> I know this is gonna kill him. But I actually found a really decent tutorial on Python. And so the last couple of weeks I've actually been playing with Python and uh, and of course uh, our friends over at Linux Academy um, they have uh, mm-hmm. you know courseware that that can that can do some of that and and so I've been playing with that and one of the things that the 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 guide that I had was talking about the differences between uh, Python two and, two and Python three yeah and then uh, lo and behold I wake up on Thursday or whatever it was and this article hit that Python three will be shipping by default uh, in 1604 so that's huge actually because the iterations of Python it doesn't seem change very often and again mm. I am very new to this I'm very new to, to programming very very new to uh, to uh, specific uh, languages specifically Python I thought I, so I might be wrong on this, but my understanding is that it hasn't changed a whole lot. And it's the changes deal. when you go from Python 1 to 2, yeah, are huge. And now 2 to 3 are huge. And so the fact that that's going to ship by default um, in, well, next year, uh, I guess, is, is, actually, is actually pretty big. And mind you, the, uh, the 16 is going to be the LTS. So that is the, that's their five-year support cycle. That's going to be, so basically what that means is Canonical has a huge vote of confidence for Python 3 because they're going to have to stick by that and support it for the next five years. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Very nice. So, yeah. Very nice. Yeah, that's a great mm-hmm. point. Uh, yeah, the fact that it's going to 16 and 4 is a, is a bigger deal than I thought. Uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> all right. So uh, this has gotten a lot of attention in the Linux Action Show subreddit. I'm one of those guys where I get excited about this stuff, but until something ships, that's when I really get excited. But there's potential here. Uh, this is really good for a bunch of games that we want to see come to Linux. CryEngine 3.7 has been announced, and official support for Linux. The CryEngine. The Cry, the, you know, like the Crisis games, like, like the big, beautiful, amazing Crytek-built games uh, are coming to Linux. And there's a couple of great games that we've been waiting for in the wings. Uh, so early heads up for developers. They can start planning their ports right now. What do you think, Noah? You're not a gamer. Do you care I've, at all? I'm not, but I do care because, the you know, when, when Steam released, the first thing I did was bought like five games. And it's not because I had any interest in playing the games or I had any interest in the fact that a gaming thing was coming to Linux because I just don't game. I just cared that I knew, I knew without a doubt that more people would be coming to Linux now, or at least it would be feasible to bring more people to Linux because of Steam. And so far, that's worked out correct. So this story excites me in that hmm. if we, if the more engines that we get on Linux, the more things that become compatible with Linux, the less reason there is 
is to use other operating systems. And I think that I think gaming specifically is such a huge niche that th what they have, you have people that they are very, very, if you've ever talked to a gamer, and I don't know that this is necessarily the case anymore, because the last couple iterations of gamers I've met, they just buy their computers at Best Buy. But there was a time not too long ago where if I wanted to know what the what the latest and greatest hardware was, I talked to a gamer because they would tell me, oh, this this video card, this is the video card you want. It will outperform everything else. And this is the motherboard. It's rock solid. And I've overclocked it and done this, that, and the other thing. And this is the processor you use. And they knew all of that stuff. And so they are people that, at least they were, people that really like to tinker with things and be in mm -hmm. control of things. And so what operating system is better suited to them than Linux? So with the, the CryEngine coming over to Linux and then obviously the games that are built on that engine, Coming over to Linux, I think that that Linux becomes more and more of a compelling operating system for gamers, and I, I think Steam really started the boat on this, right? So, uh, I, I I don't care organically as a as a, for me because well, I'm not going to play any of these games. But I, you better believe, I will be converting people to Linux that are on these games that couldn't switch before because they only worked on Windows. You and know, now they work on I, Linux. I, uh, I I I in the meantime. I mean, I'll tell you when a good, when, it, when a game finally launches that we're really excited about. I'll let you know. But in the meantime, I'm super excited because some of my old favorites, two of my favorite games of all time ever, mm -hmm. Star Trek: The 25th Anniversary and Star Trek: Judgment Rights are available under Linux on uh, GOG. They're DOSBox games. But uh, Star Trek: The 25th Anniversary is like one of the best video games ever made. Did you know that? Like seriously, not even like not even just because it's a Star Trek game. It is. It's Star Trek the twenty fifth anniversary. I've done I've done an in depth look on it. I loved it so much. You might want to go look it up. It was kind of fun. Uh, but I loved that game so freaking much. It was the first game I ever like started playing like at five p.m. and then realized at mm -hmm. three a.m. I was like I was, yeah. it was oh wow three a.m.'s here. I'm still playing this game. Yeah. Uh, so it is now available under Linux native. Um, if you've never got a chance to play it, it's super 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 great. And when you download it, GOG includes um, like all the docs and stuff, so you can get the star maps. You you can because they they this is how they did privacy protection back then is you had to have the manual, so they include the manual and all that stuff, so that way you can play the game. GOG.com has it available for Linux right now. Just a quick plug um, for a really great game. Hey, let's talk about Firefox OS. Firefox OS just got on another uh, smartphone in Africa on the Orange Carrier, uh, looking pretty great. So I don't have a lot mm -hmm. to say about this story other than just kind of following the progress of Firefox OS. Do you have any notes? Yeah, I do. So the thing is that Firefox, and I'm just switching over my uh, my tabs here to get that open. There we go. Um, so the thing that Firefox has always exceeded at, or the thing that Firefox, Firefox OS has set out from the beginning to do mm -hmm. is uh, exist in markets where other smartphones couldn't exist, where it's not financially feasible. Now that's important because I think that one of the biggest, the, the biggest factors for success or failure is focus. If you concentrate with gazelle-like intensity on one thing or another and you say this is what this is the market we're going to go for we are going to go for places in the world that don't have a lot of the financial resources to buy you know android or ios and so we need a very low powered phone but that can still do you know pseudo modern like things and then you concentrate on that you have a chance of being successful now every conference i've been to you don't know how many people come up to the firefox booth and say well when is t-mobile going to have this when is verizon going to have this when is ting going to have this and their answer is the same we're just that's just not where we're focusing on if you want to go buy one on ebay or you know here's the place that you know here's the place you can buy these phones if you want to try and make it work you're welcome to do so but we are concentrating on a world market in a place that that needs smartphones at twenty thirty dollars that's very very expensive to them um, and it needs to perform well and I've used the Firefox and I know you have too I've used a couple of the Firefox phones numerous times it feels actually pretty responsive certainly way more responsive than i would have expected a 30 or 40 dollar smartphone yeah to. that's true and so it's it, you know in, 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 and it's very usable and mm -hmm. as more and more things come to html5 more and more apps come to html5 it becomes more and more of of a useful platform so i think what firefox os is doing is fantastic is it the phone for me probably not is it the phone for you Probably not, at least not as a as a daily driver. Um, but it certainly is a fun phone, and for uh, and for people that that are have limited resources, I think it's it's a game changer. I think it, it will totally revolutionize uh, the the way that 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 uh, these people do things. Because if you're living in some of these uh, in in some of these uh, in in like Africa, a lot of times you don't have access to to power or the internet. What you do have access to sometimes anyway is a cell phone network. And if you look at in Haiti and some of these other uh, 
poorer countries, a lot of times, a lot of the pictures that are coming out, they're all being taken from smartphones, and they're all being uploaded on smartphones and shared with social media, and that's because the mobile network is the most reliable network because they don't have buried infrastructure like we have here in the mm-hmm. U.S. So, and it's cool yeah, that Firefox, it great. it's great that Firefox can play a role in those areas and, yeah. and other areas as well. Um, mm-hmm. Speaking of sort of that budget stuff, this this chip computer, the world's first $9 computer, has been blowing up this weekend. Well, it started during the week, but it's over the weekend. It's unbelievable. Uh, it's a Kickstarter project with 10,000 backers. Uh, they were going for a goal of $50,000. They've raised $532,000. They're on their way to $600,000 with 26 days left to go. It's chip, the world's first $9 computer. I'll play a little bit of their Kickstarter video. That's pretty cool. This is Chip, the world's first $9 computer. Connect over composite, VGA, or HDMI. Chip does computer things. Save your documents to Chip's onboard storage. Surf the web over Wi-Fi. Play games with a Bluetooth controller. But wait, there's more. This is Pocket Chip. It makes Chip portable. Take Chip, put it into Pocket Chip, and you can use Chip anywhere. That's so cool. You might have noticed, Chip looks a little different than every other computer. Yeah. Because we built Chip to fit into your projects. And we're so excited to see what you can do with a $9 computer. Kickstarter, we need your help. To make Chip for $9, we need to buy components in extremely large quantities. Help us make the $9 computer a reality and back Chip on Kickstarter today. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, the chat room points out they've raised ten thousand dollars in the last hour alone. Uh, so this yeah. is a Linux-powered computer called Chip, and it's designed to be able to put it into your existing projects. Uh, it does computer things, which is a, <laughs> a cute way to put it. And you probably guessed it. Yeah, it can run Linux. Uh, one gigahertz processor, five hundred twelve megabytes of RAM, four gigabytes of storage. It's got Wi-Fi eight hundred two eleven BGN and Bluetooth four point zero. I like that it works over composite too. I like the portable chip computer, um, and it looks like uh, it looks. Whatever whatever desktop Linux they're using, I noticed that it has some sort of compositor because the alt tab switcher has a nice little animation effect. What you think, Noah? Are you mm-hmm. impressed by chip? Yeah, I am. In fact, I am impressed by anything. See, the thing is, we the, the trend is shifting back, and I'm very happy about this. There was a time where, uh, and I'm sure you were at this stage too, where you went and bought, you found the hard drive that you wanted, you found the video card you wanted, you found the motherboard you wanted, you put all these things together, and you built something. You didn't go, you didn't look at the computer as, what things can the computer do for me? You right. looked at, what things can I do with the computer? And somewhere in the last couple of years, that has shifted, and this stupid fruit company has come in, and everyone just goes, I just want... I just want it to work. I just want to. I just want to spend a lot of money, and I just want it to work. I, I don't want to have to work for it. I don't want to have to understand these things. And and now now we're going back. Now we're going back to this. You know, excites the ham radio operator inside of me. Give me a tiny little computer, and don't tell me what to do with it. Don't tell me what it's capable of. Just let me figure it out. Let my mind, my creative mind, right. figure out fun things. Let me that build I can it into something. It. Build something out of it. Right. And you know, Intel had that. Um, they had that uh, that I forget it was the, the minnow board, mm. and they were they showed us how you can SSH into it and close a pair of contacts. You know what the first thing that came into my mind is I could hook that up to my garage door. Yeah, yeah. And then I could in my driveway open my laptop up, SSH into my garage door, close the contacts, and open my garage door. Now, is there any practical reason to do that? Absolutely not. Is it really fun and geeky and nerdy and, well, and it fits cool into your it? workflow? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I don't think it ever fits into my. <laughs> work. I don't think there's ever a time when I could just push right, the button fair. or I could fair. open my laptop fair. up. But but it's a fun thing to do. And and the, the fact is, these people, the people that make these the $9 computers, those are it, those are the people that are enabling the people th- like me that want to play with stuff mm. to come up with the next big thing. Because I can't afford to spend three or four or $500 on a computer that may or may not work uh, for a given project. I'll throw $9 at something and say, well, let me try this, let wow. me try this project. So and if the whole computer blows up, not the end of the tell world. Tell me you wouldn't want to get this for maybe yourself or your kids here. Uh, it's called the... Oh, po- yeah, the so sure. look at this pocket chip so this is that we saw yeah, this in the video turn it into a game boy yeah it's got look at this though it's got the gpio pins exposed at the top of the of the thing so you can still get to all mm-hmm. the gpio input uh right there which is incredible it's got holes here at the bottom for pencils which can also be used to prop it up uh this thing is the coolest it's got a strap so you can put it around your wrist it comes with a, th- a 3000 milliamp battery uh full qwerty keyboard 
rugged molded shell, fully open source. Although I've heard some people questioning if the bootloader is open source, but the rest of it's fully open source, which is pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you yeah. know, uh, is it is Richard Stallman's uh, his 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 um, his hard line in the sand is he if, if I'm not mistaken, and please uh, freedom people in the chat room correct me if I'm wrong. He's okay with uh, he's okay with the bootloader being a, a blob as long as it can't be changed, right? They're or he's fools. okay with a firmware being. Uh, being know. static as long as it, as long as it can't be changed. I don't know if that's actually. I could true. be wrong about that. I don't know if that's actually true. I think that might be the case on one of his laptops, though. I think that's why you're saying. Okay. It. Yeah. 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 Okay. So chip, it's available on Kickstarter. They don't need your money, but uh, you might as well back it because everybody else is, and you might well get you might, you might as well get one for nine dollars. Twenty six. I turned it into a little portable Game Boy. That's what I do. Yeah, especially on that uh, little uh, pocket Five, pocket 12, chip. Five gigahertz. I could do that. Yeah, you could. could yeah, that. you could. All right. If you'd like to make the news even better, Linux Action Show, go over to linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Submit stories there. Comment or vote, all of that goes in to shape our news segment. And Noah, with the news all done, let's go talk to the founder of the Corita Project. We're about to talk with Bodwin, the founder and lead developer of the Corita Project, which is an amazing open source art application. Uh, and we just dug into all kinds of stuff, including their Kickstarter that they're currently doing. But first, I want to tell you about our segment sponsor that makes this all possible, System76, creators of machines that are born to run Linux. This is the whole idea behind System76, is you don't have to mess with the hardware. You don't have to worry about that wireless chip or that graphics chip. No, no. They've taken care of all of that. They've pre-selected all of the right components. They build it on there and make sure it works great for you, from desktops to laptops, including that brand new Meerkat. They've got all of them. Go over to System76, check out some of their rigs. I love the laptops. The one that I'm using right here is my Bonobo Extreme that I've had for a long time. This is just such a workhorse for me. Uh, but their desktops, I drool at the opportunity. I wish something would fail in my, in my studio so I could buy one of these. I mean, kind of. You know, like, nobody wants it to fail, but I'm always like... When that computer dies, I'm totally replacing that with a wild dog. I do that. I just kind of put it out there in the universe, and if the universe wants to kill the computer, I didn't tell. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And I would replace it with a wild dog. I think also the Rattel Performance is one of System 76's screamers because you can start pretty low value with that. Like, it's not going to cost you much anything like uh, to buy that rig uh, face value. And then over time, you can add as you have the money. So, like, maybe, like, as a holiday comes up, you can get yourself a video card. You throw that in there, right? Because it's going to come with onboard graphics that will totally do the job, but it's got a slot available. You can throw graphics in there. You can throw more memory in there. You can throw a few more drives in there. So that's what I love about the Rattel Performance. You can start out with a rig that's really meant to run Linux. You're not going to have to fight with that hardware, and you can still probably get two, three years by adding out, adding to it and adding to it over time as your budget allows. A lot of the rigs are like that over at System76. Go check them out. Get yourself a rig built for the Linux so that way you don't have to fight with the hardware, and you get to play with that Linux. System76.com. Tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. So we brought Bodwin into the show because uh, both Noah and I are familiar with Corita, but just about, that's about as far as it goes. We know it's a great application. I've installed it a couple of times and looked at it, but I didn't know a lot about it. And I saw in their Kickstarter they were planning to take things to a whole new level and maybe even lap Photoshop. So when we, when we sat down with Bodwin, Bodwin, we got started to ask him to give us a little background with Corita and where everything sort of got started. Right. Well, what it's right now is it's a bit different from from what it started like. It started like, uh, oh, we are going to do our own Photoshop. We are going to do our own GIMP. That's more than ten years ago. I mean, uh, way more than ten years ago. It was even before my time. Hmm. Uh, there was this. I mean, you know about GIMP, of course. And at one point, someone made a patch for GIMP that made GIMP use cute, and that was really politically rather. Uh, dangerous. So huge flame wars followed, stuff happened, people said, okay, if we can't do this together with GIMP, we are going to do it on our own, and of course they failed. Uh, people started writing some code, and then the code got uh, discarded, bit rotted, uh, rewritten, someone else turned up, and a couple of years later, around 2003, uh, I and a couple of other people are still involved with the project, uh, we turned up, and we started uh, coding, and, and back then it was a hobby. It was still more or less, we are going to do everything that Photoshop does. Hmm. We're going to do everything that GIMP does. Hmm. How hard can it be? <laughs> it turns out quite hard, right? Uh, yes. A uh, couple of years later, around 2007, 2008, uh, we realized we really had to focus. You can't do everything, not, not if you want to do a good job. Mm -hmm. And we decided to focus on, on painters, on illustrators, 
comic book artists, people making matte paintings for movies, visual effects, textures. So uh, creative painting, not, not, not taking an image and, and, and making the nicest uh, photo there is of, of a landscape or, or, or a model. Uh, we were really going for painting from scratch. So, so tell me, why, <clears throat> why specifically did Krita decide to focus on the idea of actually creating an image rather than focusing on manipulation? Because by then, we realized that GIMP was actually doing a really good job already of being an image manipulation application. Mm. And we had this, this student uh, from uh, Slovakia, Lukas, Lukas Tverdi, and he had done his thesis on Krita brush engines. And that already that meant that we already had a lot of, of, of code that was focusing on painting. And and last but not least, it's 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 what I'm interested in most myself. Hmm. I mean, uh, there over my shoulder is my, my, my pot of real life brushes. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So what I'm hearing, I guess, is that you. So th we you know we have a lot of uh, a lot of photo uh, or a lot of image tools. We have GIMP. We have uh, you know Scribus. Uh, obviously, I, I'm an Inkscape user. Um, so I guess I, what I'm hearing is that um, that you we have to have these individual tools, and then as a community, we work together. And how does Krita fit into that that model? Yeah, you're exactly right. That, that's exactly it. We've got Inkscape, we've got GIMP, we've got MyPaint. Every one of these applications has its own role. And then we can tie it together using uh, common interaction models, but, but more importantly, uh, common data models, uh, co common file formats. Mm. So uh, around 2007, uh, at the Libre Graphics meeting, the Libre Graphics meeting was in Toronto this year. I couldn't visit uh, attend, but uh, back then uh, we sat down together with GIMP and MyPaint people, and we uh, decided to create the open raster file format. Uh, and this is to... a, that, that is a that is a competitor to the PSD. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, sort of. P PSD is is <laughs> P P PSD is is a raster based file format, but it is 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 really. It's really proprietary. So our open raster font, it's basically just, just a zip file and, and it's got some XML inside that describes your layer stack. And then for every layer, you got a ping image. Hmm. So it's, it's simple, it's, it's smart. Uh, it's simple enough that we can implement operability between GIMP and MyPaint and Krita, mm -hmm. uh, Blender these days also. So talking about uh, talking about Blender, um, some people might say that you're essentially copying Blender, um, or that or, or that you're uh, you know you're kind of embarking on their turf. How, how does how does Krita fit into that? Well, in in one sense, I'm really copying Blender. I'm looking at what 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 Tom Rosendahl does with Blender and and how he decides to. Uh, uh, make his project grow, and then I think that's a good idea, hmm. and I will do that as well. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, right now we are uh, focusing on an animation, uh, on animation, 2D animation. That's something that Blender obviously also can do. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is that that uh, we've got this this paint engine that that that's really powerful, and over the past couple of years we've. Uh, had a lot of requests from users. Look, I don't want to have a really complex animation. I just want to have my my thirty second hand drawn clip with onion skinning and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And 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 that's that's what we are trying to give give people now mm -hmm. uh, more or less a familiar interface that does the study animation in addition to two D painting. I've been uh, I've been watching the progress of your project uh, for a long time, and uh, it. It now it rivals honestly uh, commercial offerings. You look at it, just the the UI. You can tell it's very complete. It has a lot of features. So I noticed that uh, you are now uh, embarking on a fundraiser uh, to uh, to seek funding on Kickstarter, and uh, right. that's a big a big initiative. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the uh, the Kickstarter initiative and uh, what the funding is going towards and what the goals are and all that? It, it's actually our second Kickstarter, right. and it's not not even the first time we did crowdfunding. Lucas Tverdi, way back in 2009, when he was uh, graduating as a student, uh, 
he had this option of, of writing a thesis and doing and having a day job. And then he could choose, well, sh shall I go and build websites for my day job? Or shall we go and try to collect money so he could work on Krita full time, mm. uh, working on, on the boring stuff, bugs and performance issues. That was our first experience with some fundraiser. And that worked out really well. So uh, in 2013, I created the Krita Foundation, which is, 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 is a chartered nonprofit in the Netherlands. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, Dmitry Kazakov from Moscow, he was graduating and it was again a matter of will he find a job and stop working on Krita or can we make him continue working on Krita, preferably full time. Mm. So we started looking for, for, for ways to fund that. Uh, and so we are now in, in 2015 on our second Kickstarter. It's, it's more ambitious than the previous one. Uh, we were looking for, for, for 15K last year. It's 20K this year. It looks like we are going to make it. But then uh, if we are just made, made, made the basic funding goals, we can do these two projects that are really, really uh, difficult, actually. We have for two for about the sixth time uh, rewrite our core engine that yeah and this it sounds day. like it's a focus on speed like you want to make it really really create a really fast yeah so what what is the difference between refactoring and and rewriting um that that core engine uh well if, if you're rewriting you, you start from scratch you 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 take your 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 basic unit test you write some new code and and check whether it starts working uh, we hardly ever really throw code away. We just take the existing code, uh, come up with a better design, and then try to fit it in. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what's going to happen here. Uh, Dimitri did a proof of concept last year, uh, working on an 8K by 8K image uh, with a huge brush, and mm. that worked. Is that what but this is about? Is, this, is the speed critical for very, very large resolution files? Yes. Ah. Pe people are, are keep working on bigger images. Sure. I mean, in 2003, we thought, well, 1,024 by 768 pixel yeah, image, yeah. that's quite big. Yeah. Well, I mean, the reason why I ask is because I didn't really realize it, but it sounds like without staying aggressive, this is an area where open source could pretty quickly fall behind because the commercial yeah. offerings have a commercial incentive to continue to push that support forward. Um, so it's kind of important that we have an open source offering that also continues to push that forward. So adding to that, Chris, too, I guess, what things do you look for uh, going forward? What, what things are missing in the open source image uh, world that you want to add or that you want to, 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 get, to bring to the community? Um, well, there are a bunch of features we really know we need to add to Krita. Uh, the most important thing right now that, that, that prevents a lot of people from actually moving to open source is, is integration. Uh, because we're all separate projects, hmm. uh, it gets really hard to... Uh, well, th th this is a good example. What we are seeing on the background is David Rivois' comic, yeah. and he is using Krita and Inkscape. Yeah. He's using Krita to paint, and then he does the, 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 the text balloons in Inkscape, and then he has added some scripts to uh, do the translations. Uh, it works, but it's it's not smooth enough. It's right. not something... He had to build that. Tell you you can't you can't go to someone who's who's used to using uh, uh, Adobe tools and tell them right you have to have this application that application and write it together with a shell script. Yes. Yeah. So even if even if uh, even if they're not even if they're not exactly the same and maybe you can't take uh, somebody who has worked with proprietary art tools and put them into to the scale uh, to a realm where they're going to use these open source tools. But can people that are using open source tools can they compete with with professional artists? Do you think they can compete? Uh, you know, in the in the ever growing and and very competitive field right now of graphic design. Yes. I mean, I, I'm sure they can because I know they do. Mm. Uh, I, I meet those people all the time. There's, mm. there's David Revoir, who's been open source since 2009. But there's also uh, Rakukamad uh, Raghavendra. He's doing commercial uh, illustration in India, and, and he's 100% open source. There's a guy in Brazil who's 100% open source as well, uh, and he's to doing covers for all those magazines. So, yes, it is possible. You don't have to sacrifice quality, uh, but you might have to uh, sacrifice some time to talk to the developers of the tools. But when speaking of, uh, of international publications, I understand that the first Krita book came out um, in Japan. Could you tell us yes. a little bit about that? Uh, 
it was a complete surprise. Uh, we didn't know anything about it. Uh, <laughs> it's it's awesome. I got it from the yeah, from 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 the author. No, oh, that's wow. nice. Of him. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> it's lovely. I I can't read Japanese. Oh, uh, okay. But it's it's got lovely images in there. Uh, so when it came out, I was like, "This is so weird." I, uh, is this going to be a bunch of Wikipedia art articles and tutorials uh, all uh, uh, bound up together like we had before mm -hmm. on, on Amazon? But it's a real book. It's, it's, it starts with explaining this is free software. Uh, you can download it. It's, it gives you the freedom. Uh, it, it, and then goes through the interface, explains everything. It's, it's really cool. Does it have Kiki the Cyber Squirrel? No, uh, well, it's, it's some some images inside, but it's it's mostly uh, those really cute manga girls. So okay. I had just a couple of uh, questions about the project from the funding and things like that. Could you give me uh, an idea of the size of how about how many folks are regularly contributing to the Creator Project? Uh, I assume yourself and about how many others. Uh, can you give me an idea of the scope of the project? Yeah. There, there are about a dozen people who regularly contri cont contribute code uh, at at all levels. Uh, and then there are lots of people who are working on the website, doing resources. Uh, and sometimes the two mix up. One of our Summer of Code students this year, uh, she started out doing tutorials, and then she got really fed up with a bug in our college selectors and started working on that. And now she's going to do a brush engine for 3D texturing. That is so exciting. I, I really want to say uh, that I, I I really appreciate the work you guys do. My mom um, is a graphic artist, and I've always, always fantasized one day about moving her entire workflow over to Linux. And I, 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 I think when that happens, because I, I still believe it will happen, this uh, creator will be a, a, a cent an essential application uh, for her switch, it was for my wife's switch too. She was looking for something to do some of this kind of thing. This is perfect for her. So I, I really, uh, I can't wait. I'm going to go over to the Kickstarter project. I'll back it right now. Go search for Creator on Kickstarter. We'll have a link in the show notes. At the time of this recording, 406 backers. Uh, they have a goal of 20,000 right now. 12,000 raised. 25 days left to go. Creator.org for more information. We, we even uh, got some new backers while we were talking, I see. Great, great. That's great. Very good. Uh, is there anything else you want to touch on before we run? Uh, no, well, thank you for the opportunity of, of showing Krita to, to a whole new audience. That's awesome. Yes, you bet. Uh, and I can't wait to play around with it myself because my, my wife's been messing with it now. And so I'm like, well, now I'm watching over her shoulder. I'm thinking, I kind of want to do that stuff. So I think it'll probably happen to me, too. There, there are a couple of really good tutorials uh, around. Yeah. I would love to hear about them. Where should I check? Uh, same website. It's in the resources section. Okay. I will check it out. Um, Karita.org. Perfect. I will go there. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Linux Action Show and keep up the great work. Yeah, that brings us to the end of this week's show. But Noah, before we get out of here, we got some emails to get to. And one sort of following up on a topic from a couple of weeks ago. Sleepy11 wrote in. This is a longtime follower of JB. I'm truly glad to hear that I could make a difference by supporting you guys. Just knowing that there is one person that could be switching to Linux permanently might be worth it. Uh, so uh, this is about the MacBook Pro that uh, we sold on eBay. He said, I already own a System76, and the MacBook Pro I might give to somebody who's a Mac user who I want to switch to Linux, which is why I wanted OS X and Linux on it. Thank you so much for the feedback. Knowing how much, uh, knowing, knowing how much my support helped motivate me to keep giving back to JB, Sleepy11. One, one. So this is, for those of you who aren't familiar, my wife Angela switched over to Linux. We first put her on a MacBook, and it just felt like if we were going to, if either Noah and I were going to use it as our day-to-day -day driver, you know, it'd probably be fine. We could tinker with it from time to time. Uh, but for her, we just really wanted her to experience Linux trouble-free. We didn't want her to think of Linux as that mm -hmm. OS that requires tinkering. And so we decided to sell the MacBook on eBay and then use the funds raised from that to buy a Yoga 3 for her and have her try that, uh, which has been a much smoother experience for her. So I'm really glad that Sleepy's getting use out of that MacBook. And it's going right. to stay running Linux, too, which is really cool. 
Exactly. And that, that was what that was what hit me about the, the piece of feedback was the person mm -hmm. who bought it was not somebody who, you know, kind of casually watches the show, but really they're a Mac user. No, this is a Linux user. Yeah. And it's still he's still going to yeah. he's still going to beat that thing into submission yeah. to uh, to run Linux. And that was super exciting. Now, I actually, since you bring it up, I actually kind of wanted to, to to go into that a little bit. So mm -hmm. uh, apparently there was some there was some kersnuffle in the in the chat room about why when you walked out of the house, you said, Noah. Go ahead and put a bunch of uh, 1404 LTS on there with GNOME, and then when you walk back in, somehow Antergos wound up on the laptop. And so, <laughs> I I understand that that there was a little bit of confusion, and then right after that, like immediately following, it was like the laptop works. We gave it to her, and then oh, by the way, we're three days late planning for Linux Fest Northwest. So we kind of launched into that, and I never really got a chance to 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 debrief you on that. Um, so th basically, what happened was I went to install. Uh, Ubuntu with GNOME. And I texted you and said, hey, what version of GNOME do you want? You said, I want 3.16. I said, all right. So I tried to install 3.16. Turns out 3.16 doesn't ship with the LTS. All right, no problem. I can get a PPA and do it. Well, actually, that P PPA that we found, 404s. So that wasn't working. So now I have a fresh install as of like five minutes, and I already have a 404 uh, for a PPA. So that, that wasn't really good. So that's fine. We'll use the older one. It's no big deal. Yeah, all right. 3, 4, so then I go okay. to install then I go to install Numix, and I open up the software center Numix. Well, it costs $2.99. Not a problem. I don't mind. I'll contribute $3 to a project I like, especially to get Angela on Linux. Well, wait, I have to create an Ubuntu, an account to do that. Well, what account do I use? Because if I use Angela's email, she's going to get the confirmation, which I then won't have. If I use mine, then my account is permanently tied to her computer, and that's not really the way I wanted to do it. So, okay, fine. I'll worry about that later. Uh, wait. I've lost internet. Why have I lost internet? Oh, it's an airplane mode. Why is it an airplane mode? Something turned into airplane mode the way that that Broadcom chip works. So Rakai sitting next to me, who is, if no one knows, he's like the master of Google. In fact, he like invented Google secretly. So I said, Rakai, use your Google foo and, and find this out. So in like half a second, he's like, okay, I found the answer. Um, <laughs> what you need to do is boot off of a live Fedora install. <laughs> and that's the way to turn airplane mode back off. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, the way the Broadcom thing works, it won't work in a bunch. You have to use Fedora. And I'm like, no. No. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put Antragos on the computer, and if all of this other crap doesn't happen in Antragos, we're just going to stick with Antragos. So I put Antragos in, and the airplane, the Broadcom thing just worked right off the bat. So all of those problems, coupled with the biggest factor, which was Angela was like, she was super happy that she was using real BA Linux. It wasn't. It wasn't this. It wasn't this. Uh, you know, dumbed down stuff. It was actual Linux. And she's. She was so excited to grab Linux by the balls. Screw this horn stuff. Grab Linux by the balls. And now we're going to take that away and go back to Ubuntu. Ubuntu, which by the way has all these little issues that uh, just mm. wa wasn't going to meet what you wanted to do. And I'm thinking to myself. I looked over. I have Ubuntu 14.04 running on my laptop at the studio at that point. And I'm like, I am having challenges figuring out how to get these the new mix theme on there with this account thing and all this other stuff how's it going to be for you if you ever have to reload this thing or if you have to go and troubleshoot mm -hmm. something to do this on ubuntu well that's how she wanted now to, to avoid all the feedback yes i am aware there is a new mix ppa you don't have to get it through the software center yeah right you can go get oh, okay, it okay okay yeah, yeah but um i follow what you're saying and uh, yeah and so far it's working fine so it hasn't been an issue yeah. so far uh, so uh, now Don S wrote in with a book Noah like the next American <laughs> novel it's it's unbelievable uh, can you summarize uh, Don S's email yes. into the show here yeah so Don S uh, wrote in and he said he was he was on a uh, on a form and he had posted um, he had posted uh, about Windows 10 on the Raspberry Pi and he said his post was this is absolutely horrible in my honest opinion the Raspberry Pi has promoted computing freedom by, rem uh, uh, by removing the price barrier for a computer. At the hmm. same time, it introduced software freedom to the Pi by giving their first taste of open source freedom. You may say nothing has changed, but it has. Give it to a kid who is eating garbage, a choice between candy and a piece of fresh fruit, and see what happens. This is another example of how Microsoft gets their hands on something wonderful and turns it into hmm. a steaming pile of... Uh, at womp, first, womp. the reply... and then So anyway, what ends up happening is they deleted it. They deleted his post and oh. said that, you know, and I thought that was totally valid criticism. I think that is completely accurate. I, and, I, and I think it is, I think it's valuable for anyone that thinks it's no big deal that, that so he uh, was Microsoft. Re he was so if I'm following, he was responding to the Raspberry Pi folks saying I'm not really happy with Microsoft getting involved with right. this. Yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. Which, by the way, I think is, is spot on criticism. Yeah. So then he wrote in to the Raspberry Pi Foundation and said, hey, I've enjoyed your post on the Raspberry Pi blog. Today I responded to the post about Windows 10 on the Raspberry Pi. And then he included the text. I noticed that the post reply has been deleted. Is it because you found it offensive? This is something I feel quite passionately about. I am a software mentor at a local high school robotics team, and I have been promoting the use of Raspberry Pi and similar projects teaching programming to kids. I'm hoping that your organization does not stifle opinions on the future of computer freedom. If this is the case, RaspberryPi.org partnering with Microsoft, a company who's been uh, prosecuted for a number of unfair uh, trade practices, I will need to select a different tool for teaching computing. Now, that, again, is very, very eloquently put. I, I think he hits the absolute nail on the head, and it's something that I responded the same way. I just couldn't formulate mm. a thought as succinctly as he put mm. it. Microsoft getting in bed with the Raspberry Pi, I think, is overall a bad situation, because if if Microsoft's big... They use the shotgun approach. Put Windows on everything, get everyone interested in Windows, and then even if yeah. people don't like Windows, they'll stick with it because it's what they know. Yeah. And this is... The, the Raspberry Pi was the one thing that started to set us apart from that, because people were saying, yeah, well, Windows is great, but A, it doesn't run on the Pi, and B, uh, the Pi is... I, I'm, learning about, I'm learning about Linux. And then once they kind of got into that, then there really wasn't a reason to get back out well, because the pie was what they knew. Here's the problem. And, I, and I now that's changing. I track your concern. I do follow what you're saying. <sighs> how, can we, how can we be a free and open source community if when people want to come and get involved, we say you're not allowed? You just can't. It doesn't work yeah. like that. You can't well, have one and the Microsoft, other. And what, so I mean, Microsoft my has every right to play in this field as anybody. And, and to be honest with you, uh, what, I, what, I would, what I would ask you to ask yourself is it, I mean, everything you just said is absolutely true, but is, is it also maybe you're concerned about the competition? Maybe, maybe, maybe a, a, a minute amount, maybe just a little bit. Really what it boils down to is if Microsoft wanted to make a Windows 10 uh, ISO and put it up on their website and say, here, you can flash this through Raspberry Pi, wouldn't have a problem with it. That, I, that I think, would follow what you're saying about Microsoft can compete. Not really. Oh. I, it, it looks, it seems to me, I, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm misunderstanding the way that this is working, yeah. but it seems to me that they are they are forming this this partnership in which they're going to, you know, maybe sell Raspberry Pi yes, pre-installed with yeah. Windows. Yeah. So stuff like that, I think it's that both, is though? where I think... I mean, I do know it is the hardware yeah. being pre-bundled with Windows. I, I would right. imagine they must make the ISO available, right? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, well, I've don't. i never yeah. had any interest in trying it, so I've never looked. But yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> that approach does feel more like... Uh, uh, I guess what you're what you are getting over. upset about is um, if you're just putting your ISO up on a web page, then you're playing by the same rules of the game everybody else right. is. When you're starting yeah. to throw down millions to a, to, a, to a business that needs money and starting to maybe buy a little influence... And maybe getting them to change the direction, maybe change the focus a little bit, that's right. a little unfair because, you know, uh, obviously Debian, the, Rasb the Raspbian guys can't afford to go in and be like, here, here's some scratch. How about you feature us exactly. a little bit on your homepage? Um, and how about you? How about you? How about we'll give you the SD card for free if you sell it with the pie? When you when you sell a pie, just go ahead and throw this little yeah. uh, SD we'll card we'll in here that, that has SD everything card. installed. Yeah, yeah, we can't. They can't afford to do that. And here's the thing: Microsoft would have no freaking interest in the Raspberry Pi if it hadn't taken off because of the the hard work of the open source community and the Linux community that made it a useful tool. It was just the stupid little circuit board that was selling for twenty nine dollars on the internet by some Yahoo that wanted to teach kids about computing. And now that it's it's taken off yeah. now it's oh we can make money off of it so now we're interested Sounds so now like we'll just now we'll throw money at yeah it, it, so that b drives me nuts and this guy hit the nail on the head and then they had to censor him because they didn't like what he was saying well you know then again so in the feedback. then again you know microsoft could totally blow this i mean windows 10 could totally they suck will. on the raspberry pi too and it could just be it, it, could, it could end up being a shining example of why windows isn't cut out for this type of thing it could be horrible for yeah them. i don't th there, there, i mean here's the thing if, from a principal standpoint i get really upset from a realistic standpoint, Not nobody is buying. Nobody, yeah, nobody yeah. is buying a no. a, to, a, a a project computer to put Windows on. Yeah. That's just not happening. The people that are interested in yeah. tinkering with stuff like that, the right. mere fact that you have to put the circuit port inside of a case, yeah. that alone it's, is going to separate the, the people, people from the people, that want to use Windows. I just don't see it. The people that want to use Windows on the Raspberry Pi are people that are going to be happy living on the command line, which I call those people Linux mm -hmm. users. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm not too worried yeah. about it. All right, I don't think it's a serious concern.
Philip K. writes under Flip K. Philip, Philip, Philip. Uh, hey, you've uh, now mentioned twice on the show that Firefox doesn't work with a touchscreen. I recently bought the HP Split X2 with a touchscreen. I was actually going about dual booting Windows 8 and Arch on the machine, but after using Win 8 for a few hours, I got so mad <laughs> that I formatted the drive and just installed Arch. My favorite browser, though, is Firefox. I use Chromium for Netflix, so not having touch support in Firefox was uber annoying. My solution was to install the Firefox extension, Grab and Drag. It enables rudimentary touch support and makes Firefox usable with a touchscreen. Chromium still has better touch support, but Firefox will grab and drag, and it's doable, and I'm really happy. So there you go, Noah. There's a way to make Firefox touch ha ha capable. I bet you're thrilled. No, I'm not thrilled, and here's why. And I wish, I, if, if I could go back through the shows, the, through the entire history of the Linux Action Show, there are a couple of clips I would grab and keep in my personal collection to just to load up at night and laugh at, and one of them would be <laughs> when you when you <laughs> went to do the Firefox show. Listen, here's the thing. There are a few times, well, I shouldn't say a few times, I agree with you the majority of the time, but there are a few times where I am sitting at my computer screen screaming, he nailed that, he nailed that, he's totally on. And the last time that happened was when you went to the Firefox challenge and people are inventing new extensions yeah, to yeah. make Firefox a usable browser for you. And then when it crashes, as you correctly pointed out, well, then everyone says you have too many extensions. So, yes, I understand that there is an extension. I was already aware of this extension, as I'm sure you were aware that this extension existed for, uh, for drag and drop. And it has been around for a long time. However, Firefox still doesn't actually have the same touch support that Chrome does. An extension for Firefox will enable you to have the same extension for or, uh, the same support that, that Chrome has. And I am saying this as a Firefox user. I don't use Chrome. In fact, I hate Chrome. I exclusively use Firefox. But even I, when we sat down and you were showing me that monitor, there's no there's no comparison. Chrome is a better browser for I like I like it's my that pinch and zoom. I like it, no. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's just it's, that simple. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I am really glad to see that there is at least that extension because during the faux show, Angela sits here and she uses Firefox mm -hmm. and sometimes she'll reach over to Smart do it. Woman. And she's using Firefox on her yoga as well. So and the mm -hmm. yoga has a touch screen. So I I'll, I think I'll install that for her. So she gets a little uh, basic. You know, I would send, I, if, if she was in your neck of the woods, I'd say, Angela, go to Alta Speed. Go to Alta Speed to get your needs taken care of. In fact, Angela, whenever you have a problem, just call Noah. Go to Alta Speed, right, Noah? <laughs> yeah. Her your and, way. Then she, and, and you and, and make sure you get the laugh in at the end. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that from the interview. Um, yeah. But yeah, if you're in the Grand Forks area, give us a call. We'd That's, be happy to help. That is nice. And uh, Noah will show you how you can pinch and zoom. Vroom, 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 That's right. Vroom, vroom, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> over at altaspeed.com. On Firefox, nonetheless. Uh, on and Firefox. You can also follow him on Twitter. He's at Colonel Linux on the Twitter. I am Chris LAS. And you can email the show. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Click the contact link. And then choose Linux Action Show from the drop down. But you know what's even better? That subreddit. <laughs> LinuxActionShow.reddit.com. Woo! -wee! You can put news in there, pics in there, discussion threads in there, feedback up in there, memes in there. Uh, Noah as RoboCop. Was that who you were? RoboCop? And yeah, you're, yeah, I was RoboCop. Yeah. You were the guy with the, the fangs on Wolverine, your Wolverine, dude. You don't know who Wolverine is? Wolverine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I drew a blank. I've seen <gasps> all the movies. I've seen all the movies. Wolverine. Yeah. Logan. Just call me. You can just call me Logan, though. You don't have to call me Logan. I'll call you Logan? Okay. Yeah. And then Alan was Superman. That was pretty cool. I think Alan had the best. I didn't see Alan Superman. He had the best one. I, I didn't see it. That's lame. I'll have to go look. Meanwhile, look it up. meanwhile, so let's see. Robocop. Yeah, I think I'd take Wolverine over Robocop, but I think I'd take Superman I over. Yeah, yeah. All right. No, I'd take Wolverine overall. Superman, he, dude? He's, he's afraid of nothing. He's like, yeah, no, he's like, he's like, I don't care. What but, if you made air make his claws out of kryptonite? Well, Boom. and you know what? That's true because kryptonite is a pretty serious flaw and. That isn't a problem for yeah. Wolverine. That's a good point. Yeah. All right, so there you go. Uh, don't forget the show is also live. We do this on 10 a.m. Pacific, which is uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. UTC, I think. Go to uh, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted to your local time. It's jblive.tv, Sundays, 10 a.m. Pacific. Get to hang out in the chat room in between segments. We talk about stuff. This morning I was running into walls and race the sun while I listened to uh, the Glitch Mob. You can tune in for that, too, if you get here early enough. And uh, it's a heck of a show, a lot more show. But then we always do make it available on demand. We have RSS feeds for audio and video over at Jupiter Broadcasting. Just look in the show notes, and then you get the show automatically when we release a new episode. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. To all the moms out there from the Linux Action Show and the chat room, happy Mother's Day, moms. We love you. That's pretty epic. That worked out really well. <laughs>
Yeah, that's good stuff, Jaren. That's good stuff. Oh, I should probably I should do it too, huh? Dang yeah. it! Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I forgot. It's it's all right. You have time. You have time. Nobody type. If anyone types, I got it. Them. I got it. Oh, there you go. Oh, and then Angela yeah, tweets some crap right in there and ruins it. Way to go, Angela! Oh my gosh. Uh, so <laughs> I got to tell him the whole story because no, you don't even know this part. You don't even know this part. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I, I don't th I, so uh, every morning, you know, because I'm either doing Tech Talk today or yeah, and, and actually Friday morning, I I canceled Tech Talk because I needed a down morning because I was going on a hike, supposedly. Noah. Anyways, I'll get to that. So. Um, <clears throat> I wake up and I, you know, take care of the kids and I talk with Ange and then after everything's kind of settled and uh, I'm starting to, before I leave, I'll usually check the headlines. Uh, and so I, and then because, you know, Linux Action Show, Linux Unplugged, I always check the Linux headlines first specifically every single day so that way I can follow the news in the morning and process stuff and think about it throughout the day. And uh, so I, I start by, you know, going to like Linux Action Show subreddit and I see something on there like something about a Krita interview. I'm like, oh, people found out we're, we're interviewing the Krita developer. But I didn't really read the full thing because I'm still kind of waking up. And I, nothing really jumped out at me. So I said, well, I'll go see what our Linux is talking about. So I go over to our Linux. And I don't know, do I still have the screenshot? I sent Noah a screenshot of it. I should pull this up. <laughs> this is really funny. Yeah, I'm like, Telegraph. This is what I, yeah. Okay, let me, yeah. Uh, let's see. Boy, you and I have talked a lot since then, though. Yes. Uh, where is it? I did send you a screenshot of it, right? You did. You did. I'm going to find it first. Wow. Jeez, I sent. Wow. I don't. I don't. I don't even know. So I. I go to r. I go to reddit.com slash r slash Linux, and uh, at the top of r slash Linux is the Linux Action Show is develop is interviewing the creative developer at noon today. On the top of our Linux, the Linux Action Show is interviewing the creative developer, and I'm like, what? We are. I didn't know I was going to be live at noon interviewing the Karita developer. Like, I'm finding out about the interview and when it's going to be live at the top of our Linux that morning. I'm like, so then I go to Twitter and I realize, like, it's being discussed on Twitter. It's then, and that, yeah, there it is. There's the screenshot. And yeah, there, yeah, and then that from Twitter made it over to our Linux. And then from our Linux, it made it over to the Linux Action Show subreddit. And then basically it's like, okay, well, now we're committed. Now, now we've actually got to do it. And I'd already made plans that, that morning. I was going to go on a hike because Washington's freaking beautiful. So I, and to clear my head and just, you know, sort of relax a little bit. So I sort of made the hike a little bit shorter, but maybe managed to make it back about a half hour before the interview. And then when we got live, uh, our guest had some issues and we had some miscommunications. He ended up being like 40 minutes late anyways. I probably could have done the whole hike. But, well, uh, I don't. In his defense, I don't think he was actually late. I think right, it was he was waiting on Skype. Skype yeah, and, yeah. I, there was a bit of a miscommunication. That that's part of the the thing when you have producers set things up and then uh, we're trying to relay things. And but um, what? Uh, yeah, I had no idea any of that had happened.